be hard to penetrate. It would be copper, you can make weapons, you can make uh, lots of stuff. Um, and there's that uh, verse 10. You will eat, you will be satisfied, and bless the hour of So remember we talked last week about the fact that we bless after we eat? Yes. It's kind of a reminder of that. Kind of an echo of that. So you get the idea that Abba tends to repeat himself. Why do you think that is? Because we're talking to him. Well, I also had a rabbi explain it to me that when you're when you're in want, you're more likely to come before the Lord. But when you are full, you're less likely to do. Absolutely. That's that's a look at our country right now. I mean, mm -hmm. God's uh, uh, byproduct of life is bad in most lives. And why? No one's scared. No one. No one relaxed. No one. You know, there's no real need in this country. There is. It's coming. Kind of, uh, and that's been cyclical even just in the in the history of America. America goes into great need or war or distress of some kind, the church is still up. You know, I'll never forget when uh, back in, I guess it was 1990, I was stationed in Georgia. And me and a, a buddy of mine were going out on every Friday night. Interesting that it was Friday night because we'd always get there right when the Sabbath began. But at the time it just didn't register what time of the week it was, but we'd go out to the Walmart parking lot to witness to the young folks in this town we were stationed in. And uh, when the war broke out, of course, we were in a military town, and there were Marines and sailors, that's Hacker, who was hanging out in the Walmart parking lot on Friday night. Uh, that's a small town thing. Tell me why we would go <laughs> When there's nothing else to do, you go to the Walmart parking lot. Or Cruise of Sonic. So, so we'd go there every Friday night when the war broke out. All of a sudden, everybody was interested in what we had to say. You know, all these young Marines were concerned about. You know, they knew they'd get called up. And like, you know, of course, we're we're showing the passages that are about Babylon. You know, freaking these boys out. <laughs> So, yeah, when things get scary, all of a sudden you turn to God. And that is a biblical concept, is when, when people are in hunger, they will turn to God. When they're satisfied and, and have everything, they tend to forget. That's why he tells us, after you've eaten, bless. And so I think it puts us in a habit of being thankful toward him. And, and the discipline part is, I don't want to be arbitrarily thankful. Or thanking him just because that's what I do. You get what I'm saying? But to have a genuine heart of gratitude for his goodness for us. There's one verse that comes to mind, it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. Yeah. You know, so if we're if we really belong to him and he's putting his blessings on us, then we're going to continue to hone our lives and to and to be grateful not only for the material blessings, but for the fact that he does that in spite of the fact that we know we fail. You know what I'm saying? Okay. <clears throat> Eleven. Take care lest you forget the Yahweh your Elohim by not observing his commandments, his ordinances, his decrees, all those things we've already studied pretty in depth, which I command you today. Lest you eat and be satisfied. Here's that very concept Karen was talking about. And you build good houses and sell, and your cattle and your sheep and goats increase, and you increase silver and gold for yourselves, and everything that you have will increase, and your heart will become haughty, and you will forget the Yahweh your Elohim. There it is. Right there. Who took you out of the land of Mitzrayim from the house of slavery? Who leads you through the great and awesome wilderness? A snake, fiery serpent, scorpion, and thirst where there was no water. Who brings forth water for you from the rock of flint 
<clears throat> who feeds you manna in the wilderness, which your forefathers knew not, in order to afflict you, in order to test you, to do good for you in your end. And you may say in your heart, My strength and the might of my hand made me all this wealth. Then you shall remember the Allah your Elohim, that it is He who gives you strength to make wealth in order to establish His covenant that He swore to your forefathers as this day. Amen. Okay, so this is, I've, I've quoted this quite a bit, as a matter of fact, with counseling people about their finances. This verse always comes to mind because the American mindset is, and I've, had, I've actually had discussions with senior Christian people who still think that it's their hard work that gives them their money. Mm -hmm. You know? And there is, there is an element of truth to that. In other words, you do have to be working in order to produce something. But do you know if I wanted to, it doesn't matter how hard you work. If he wanted to shut you down, he'd shut you down. Mm -hmm. He'd just turn off the spigot. And that's what a lot of people don't recognize, and so they take credit for their own, for all their blessings. They don't see one of them. Where's first Jay? <laughs> when I get into this conversation, I'm always reminded I was teach, trying to teach this concept to my kids. Jay was about three or four years old. Where do all, things, all good things come from? First thing out of Jay's mouth, Walmart. <laughs> Sometimes I'm just that good. 
don't know if you've ever heard us sing the Robin Mini Okay, or heard the song, there's a popular song out, Robin Mini I looked it up, and this is what this is what is being uh, quoted in that song. So this is not necessarily haughty in the sense of that you might think of, but you lift yourself up, you think highly of yourself. You you, you could say that you elevate yourself toward deity. Right? And it's your heart that you lift up your heart. And you forget. Right. That you forget Yahweh, your Elohim, who brought you out of Mitzrayim. Okay, now if, if you're thinking about this on the Peshach level, uh, from the house of bondage from okay so what have I told you I brought it up in the garage a couple of times that beats right means on sort of a double trouble double trouble <clears throat> okay you could you could break it down even further mine is water tsar is tribulation yam is sea uh, tsarim double trouble there's multiple ways to break this word down but so, and the reason I bring that up is because we all believe that the Torah applies to us, and I believe that, that on a spiritual sense, this still applies to us, even though, I mean, I'm Jewish, Shelley's Jewish, there's a few in here who are, and so it applies on a sort of historical genetic level, if you know what I'm talking about. But Gentiles, who do not descend from Judah, might think that, they, that this doesn't apply to them. He didn't bring them out of Egypt, okay? And on a historical, on a, on a historical, just peshat plain meaning of the text level, sure, that's true. However, to graft it in, and so they become your ancestors in that sense. And at the same time, there is another bringing out that Yeshua has done for us. Which happened at Passover, which happened at this very same time of the year, uh, where this does apply. He brought us out of double trouble or the troubles of, of life, okay? Out of the house of bondage, we big Abadim, the house of enslavement, okay? We were in bondage to sin. We had. We had spiritual distress that we couldn't do anything about in our souls, and he brought us out of that. Okay? So, <clears throat> um, just any time that you're reading in these uh, Tanakh passages where he's talking directly to Israel, I, I, I go on multiple levels here. I think about the not only the sort of the genetic inheritance side of it, but also sort of the spiritual side of it where it was kind of repeated. When you shoot it in We're in verse 14 still. Yeah, that's the end of verse 14. <laughs> okay. Nahash Saraf Ma'akra. Those first two really interest me. Okay, Nahash and Sarah. Okay, so let me start in verse 15 in English. Who leads you? Who leads you? 
through the awesome wilderness, and then all of a sudden he puts Nahash and Sarah. Okay? It may not mean anything to you if you haven't studied Hebrew for very long, but Nahash is the word for serpent, which is the same word that is used of Hasatan, the tempter, in the Garden of Eden. Okay? And this other one, Sarah, anybody ever heard of the Seraphim? So what is a Sarah? <coughs> same exact word. The seraphim are the burning, bright burning angels that he put in front of the garden to, be, to protect it, right? And so, uh, we, I think when we, I don't know if it was when we did our review of this class where we looked back at numbers. Do you, do you guys remember that? It's been a long, long time ago. <laughs> when we started this book, we saw that the book of Deuteronomy in the first few chapters actually summarizes Exodus what? Exodus what? And we stood. <laughs> Yeah, somebody would pray. <laughs> All the way through numbers what? <laughs> somebody will find it in their notes. Okay, so we, so we look at a summary of Exodus and Numbers, and I don't know if it was when we studied that that we actually saw the Sarah in detail, but, but we've looked at this word, I would say, in the last year or two, year and a half. At some point, we looked at this and pointed out that the Sarah, that was the fiery serpent that bit them in the wilderness, <coughs> with the snakes, and, and he lifted up a, uh, a serpent on a pole, remember? Yeah. It was, and they looked at that, they were safe, right? They were safe, okay? So, <coughs> that's the same word. And it means fire. You'll actually see this as a verb for burning or fire. Okay, in some places. Uh, but what he's talking about here is in verse 15, who leads you through the great and awesome wilderness. And at that same phrase, yeah, I think it was during the I think it was during the look back at numbers that we looked at this. Anybody agree with me? Anybody's memory with me enough to say that? It was around that time. I think it was. <laughs> that uh, because because we already had this phrase about the wilderness, great and awesome. Okay, Gadol, Benarah, which are words usually attributed to whom or what? To Abba, right? To who? Abba. 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 So, so you have, so you have at the beginning of verse 15, uh, Mean man babi okay, I'm in the wrong word. Abolihaha, Abolihaha, Babi Ba, Hagadol Nehanara. So there's two words that are usually attributed to Abba. Okay. <coughs> that are now being linked to this wilderness. Okay. Nahash. Now, if you were to read this literally, uh, you could actually read it as a serpent, a seraph, a, a fiery one. <clears throat> okay, and, and so the way mine reads in English is uh, it's actually pretty good. A snake, comma, fiery serpent, serpent, comma, scorpion, comma. And thirst. Okay. Akrav de Simamon. Scorpion and thirst. Okay. So that, that first part almost to me immediately, at least when I read it in, in Hebrew, kind of starts talking about spiritual warfare. Okay, and 
And did, did you catch that Abba said, He leads you through this great mountain, who brings forth water out of the rock of Flint, who feeds you with manna, which they do not, in order, in order to afflict you, and in order to, to test you, to do good for you in your end. Okay. Now I'm going to read that, that part uh, in Hebrews. That's the end of 16. Lema'an Anotecha lema'an Mesotecha Nehetibecha Ve'acharitecha Okay. Now that could, to me, be Okay, so what do we call the end of days? I'm a James. Acharit Hayamim. That's the same word. Acharit Your end. Your finish is the way you can put it. Now, who's he talking to here? Get specific grammatically as to who Abba is talking to here. Israel. He's talking to Israel. So, is he talking to that generation? Or is he talking to all of Israel? All of Israel. Past, present, future? Yes. Well, specifically in that sense, he's talking to the current, and they've gone through all of that. He's been given to them. Definitely in the future, you can see that. But yeah, but the ones who, the ones who were really going through it as adults have already died. So the ones who were responsible had already died. That's what I'm getting at. Is he, to me, he's, he's, even on the Peshach level, he's, he seems to be talking to more than one generation. You get what I'm driving at? Surely on a, on a spiritual level, and when you get up into the deeper levels of study, obviously, he goes very broad. But even to me, on the Peshach level, he's talking to more than one generation. He's talking to the yeah. one that went through it, the one that is there standing before him, and whoever goes across into the land and inherits it and does all the things that he talked about, build, build stuff, because it's going to take a while to build houses and plant and start harvesting with pomegranates and date honey and all that. You get what I'm saying? So yeah, to me, he's at least talking to three generations. He, he, he does say before when he's talking uh, about all the stuff, he goes, he makes the comments um, uh, to. Um, of your fathers. Your fathers. That's what I'm driving at. Is he's talking, he's talking all the way from Abraham, at least. And the book of Galatians tells us that Abraham is the father of all who trust in Yahweh. Right? Okay? So I do believe that even on a pet shot level, you could you could see this, that he's talking to all of spiritual Israel. Everyone who would be a person of faith. So <clears throat> Let me ask you this. Was it good for Israel then, for us, for Israel, was it good for us, for Israel to go through the wilderness? Yes. yes. Wow. Somebody had to rehearse it. Somebody had to rehearse it. Yeah, because everything, yeah, everything they've gone through, we will go through. Or we have already gone through. I've never tasted manna in my life. Of course. But he has fed you he provides for you. Yeah. 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 You need the, you know, the man, but he provides for you. I have never seen bread fall out of heaven. Yeah. But it's got to get up and go out there like, and... Isn't Yeshua the bread of life? That's the point that I'm trying to get Maureen to make, and she's refusing to do it. <laughs>
put ours up for people who are interested in coming here. Not, not because we're trying to save the world. You know what I'm saying? We put ours up, to, which is, a, a, it embodies the common core <coughs> of, ooh, that's a bad choice of words. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bad choice of words. It embodies the boundaries of what we believe everyone in our congregation should know. Even though not everyone in our congregation can articulate that, that's what we want everyone to know and, and, and to agree with. You know, at least that much. You know, and then there's so much more to the word of Elohim. But, uh, but I love that picture too. Of, you know, they got in the wilderness, they got tired of them. They wanted more, something to decide. Yeah, and that, that's, where, that's, that's people going off to the internet and, and finding tickets in New Zealand who they don't know to be their rabbi, to be their teacher, to be their prophet, to be their leader. You know, I, I can't tell you how many people that have come come through this congregation, they've come in and they've moved on, who before and after are basically answering to some prophet on the other side of the earth. It would surprise you if I named names and told you who does that. People that you know who are now gone, who are basically part of an internet church. That to me is sad. Because they're, you know, and, and it's not that you don't need teachers, you do need teachers. And so there does need to be someone, you know, helping to articulate the scriptures for people. But there is a need for that. But, um, it should be that the people that are teaching you are trying to point you straight up to Messiah. You know, and not be the one to put information in your head. Do you get one and drive that? I don't know if it's come out like I'm trying to say it. There should um, be people that you know that you can see their hair. You should be able to see their walk. Yeah, you should be able to know what they did what they do in their lives and see their walk and understand their fruits and be able to partake of their fruits on a, on a daily basis. And and make sure that you know, this is someone who's genuinely trying to get me to up. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and that's not the case a lot of times. So, uh, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. And then that's the man. That's the point that you were trying to make, Maureen. I just wanted you to, to finish articulating this. And, and uh, <clears throat> So yes, we, we theoretically we have partaken of, of the manna, which is I, we experience it in here a lot when someone new comes in and they see something in the scriptures for the first time. They've read it a thousand times, right? And all of a sudden, <laughs> the light comes on, the bell rings, a puppy comes out. Oh my gosh, I'm seeing this for the first time. That's the manna, that's the living word. That happened to me two weeks ago while I was in here. Good. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's what we that's what we're shooting for. Yeah, the last of that that as I read it in the English, it sounds like I tried you so that you do you good in later time, so that you would realize it and come back That's why I'm reading it. Yeah. And is that what it, kind well, of what it says in the Hebrew? Well, it, yeah, it can say it that way. But you got to remember, Hebrew is a dynamic language. So if we look at it, let's see, that's the end of verse 16, right? Yeah, uh, uh, Nes nasotecha lehetivecha beacharitecha. That he might do good to you in your end or in your finish. Right. So it's sort of like the trials, the, the, the wondering, the every test, so that, so that in the end, you will see. Sure, yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. Uh, that word, Naso Teka, it is related to Kiti, Sa, and Naso, two of the names of our Parshas. Yes. And one of them says to take a census. Well, the word used for census is that word, Naso, or Kiti, Sa, I'm not quite sure. Um, before a census, I guess it would be called, and um, 
what I've seen is that it's more of a measurement. Measure these guys out, see how they shape up. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's what a test is, is a measure. So I think that, that is a good way to look at that. This comes from the root, the root word, uh, nes. And uh, yawah nisi. You hear that? You'll, you'll, you'll hear it in old church songs, Jehovah nisi. Mm -hmm. uh, it, <clears throat> It gets translated as banner, but it's actually better in that context than miracle. But it's also better as Yahweh, the one who tests me. Because that <coughs> test also means prove. And if you're a perfect engineer and you build something, you're not really testing it because you know you built it correctly, you're proving that it works, right? There, there were times in, 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 in a company I used to work for where we uh, built a simulation of every process that we were engineering the control system for so that our control system could talk to a phony process so that when we went out to the real process, we didn't have to touch anything. It was always the instrumentation that was wrong. And we proved it time and time again. And so uh, that that's basically... It kind of changed the meaning of this to this. They're related, right? Because if you test something and it passes the test, it's been proved. It puts up a green flag. Bingo. Yeah. A banner. That's right. So, <clears throat> uh, yeah, and then, so it is a measurement. Uh, Can I just say something? Sure, absolutely. Um, uh, um, that verse becomes particularly sweet. When, when you approach it that way because like um, none of us would ever choose to go through the tough trials and afflictions but when I look back on my life it was during those trials and afflictions and coming on the other side of it that my faith in him grew exponentially compared to when everything was just something and that's the thing I want you to begin to think about it, and, and it, is that when, when you're going through testing, because a lot of people will, I think we look at this from the wrong, we look at it through our lens and not his lens, and so we end up with a wrong perspective on going through trials. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about when Abba decides to test one of his own, it's not that he doesn't know whether or not you're going to pass. He already knows what he has put in you. He knows you're going to pass. And he wants you to see that you can pass. That's totally different than a teacher wondering whether or not a student has studied enough to pass the exam. And that's typically what we get in our mind is, have I, am I ready for this test? I haven't had time to study. I haven't had time to prepare for this test. Because if the test of life <coughs> don't come when you think you're prepared for it. Right? Yeah. And, and so it's more, I mean, it's a gift. It's so sweet because he's allowing it to prove to you. Not only that, but it's working out. It's, it goes back to the olive press. It's also the testing is can be the press of the olive where you're, you're being mashed up against the other olives. For what purpose? To get all the sweet oil, the good oil out of you. So that the menorah will burn. Oh, okay. that's super sweet. <laughs> <laughs> so, Get the impurities of life out of us, and most of most of our impurities are selfishness. Mm 
They're rooted in self in some way. Always. Always. I can be in so many you know, in my personal life, you know, even you know, when I was in politics, I've been raised in the middle of the EU government politics, and uh, I never even thought, you know, I'm in mean, the middle of the first fight, and you know, I was doing you know, so much stuff, and, and and I think that's what you know, what it is, you know, if you keep connected, even in the middle of the fire. That's the, that's what Abba is trying to teach us is that is that you know our walk is not about him giving us magic powers and going out and saving the world and being successful so much as it is he's he's put all kinds of tests in our life. There are positive and negative tests as well. Yeah. You want to drive? Yeah. Yes. There are there are challenges that he puts in front of us to see how we will react and to knock off things about us that need to be knocked off. And then there are challenges he puts in front of us to see whether or not we'll use what he, we know he's given us. Like the ability to pray for another person, the ability to witness, to, sit, to speak the glory of Elohim to another person. Um, to, to do what? To build his kingdom. Okay? Because the kingdom of Elohim is not built by pocketbooks and bricks and mortar. The kingdom of Elohim is built by converted hearts. And so... The greatest miracles in the world to me, this is why I don't I, The miracles as far as healing, so they happen. And, and they happen at, you know, when He wants them to. You know? Never usually in our time. Right? <coughs> so why sit there and beg Him for it? You know? Pray for what? Pray for the miracle that is needed and move on. And if it hasn't come and the next time a prayer comes around, pray for that miracle again and move on. But don't sit there and focus on the miracle. You know, I had a good thought that I wanted to express and I got the great one. What was it? The two greatest things I think that go on in the kingdom of Elohim are when Elohim shows us what sin is that we need to overcome. And gives us the strength to overcome that sin. Mm -hmm. And then when he brings someone who does not know him into his kingdom. To me, those are the two did you notice that Yeshua only brought him personally himself into the kingdom of Elohim 12 men? You realize that? 12 men is it. But he revealed the resurrected Messiah to in person himself. What about, you know what I'm driving at? What about you know what the I'm second about? man on the cross? Huh? What about the second man on the on the tree? There were only eleven apostles who were saved. But remember the one hanging beside him. He said, "That's number twelve. Oh, he's number That's oh, number twelve. You're right. You're right. But he had But nobody was nobody was received the rule of the Kodesh directly from him, except for those twelve. For a call. For a call. I'm talking about him being here in person, in his flesh. Paul had a vision. What Paul experienced was a vision. I'm talking about Yeshua's tenure on earth. Everybody with me now? Okay, that's fine. I just wanted to okay. clear that up. Would the women along with him not be part of them? It doesn't list them. Sure, but we don't know how many. We can't count the women. There, there, were, there were at least three that we that's know that's of. How many we have to But not in talking about men. Right. So we can actually count. Well, it's significant anyway. It's 12. It's significant. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So, so what is my point? Yeshua said that the things that he does in the kingdom, we will do greater. Okay? Those were 12 Jewish men. The only one that might have been a little troublesome would have been Matthew and the guy hanging on the tree, who was a thief. Matthew was a tax collector who most of them, it appears by all historical records that most of those tax collectors were sort of skimming off the top. And because I don't know if you remember, but when Matthew Yavin was converted, or when he was called, I should say, when he was called, everybody, he went, Yeshua went to his house that day, he called him, and then Matthew Yavin took him to his house, and everybody said, he's eating with tax collectors and sinners. Okay? Manitou was included in that. So you get you get what I'm driving at. So so it was a bit of a miracle for Manitou to come and, and to begin 
needed to serve the Messiah and then to write the beautiful book that he wrote. But most of those men were, and, and they were, but they were all Jewish. They all believed in Yah already, and none of them were pagans. None of them had to have all these years and years and generations and generations of pagan ritual and right and belief and pre-programming in their head to take out. You get what I'm driving at? You and I who witness to people, if you ever had the opportunity to bring someone into the kingdom they've never known you before and you, you confess the Messiah to them and they <laughs> see it and believe it and you bring them in and they begin to walk out the tenets of the faith, to me that's the biggest miracle. It's huge. Jamie, do you have something? No. The end? And then, um, you were talking about um, building up, and, um, and then you kind of went to God and how He builds us and talks to us and shows us our stuff. Um, and the word to build is also the word to understand. It was in here, too. So it kind of does this um, um, crossover thing. Like pulling out and putting in at the same time. Yeah. If you think about what she's talking about, is the word uh, Bina, uh, Tivne, you saw it in here, you shall build. Okay? And it specifically was talking about houses, but that word to build is actually the foundational root word for the concept of understanding. Because in order to understand, you can know thoughts, you can have information in your mind, but you may not understand the information. And so in order to understand the information, you have to build the house of whatever that information is trying to convey to you. Okay? And so understanding comes through a process of building, and you don't get, once you get understanding, then you can get uh, Chachma, which is wisdom. Okay, Anne. Um, the verse that could come to mind is that the one was talking about the verse that says, consider your boy, my brother's from the trials. That's right. That's right, and that, I guess that's kind of the whole point of all these verses and everything that we're saying here is to uh, recognize, you know, you just, you're, you're a whole lot better off in your mental state if you just recognize that difficulties are going to come. And you know, that was one of the things that Yeshua said. I didn't come to promise you a rose garden. I promised you trouble. And, and, when, and when you go through trouble, I'm the one who gets you through it. That's the promise. And so just just recognizing that, because I think where a lot of people get stressed out is they think that life has to be perfect, and if it's not perfect, then they stress. You want to talk about it? Yeah. So you mentioned the impurities in itself, and then you just talked about a Yeshua not promising the rose garden. And, um, and, and basically, that's kind of where I was going with the building and encouraging. We build a house a living edifice by encouraging building each other up and the likewise we're understanding one another at the same time. Yeah. So when we do that, the impurities kind of already start seeping out of us. That's right. Very good. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we were in 16. Amarta bilbabecha kohi de otsem yadai yadi asali et achayir hazet. Okay, this is a big verse. And you will say in your heart, My strength and the might of my hand, or the counsel of my hand, we're going to look at that here in a minute, uh, has made for me. Uh, this wealth. Alright, the word uh, for wealth there is different from what you might think. And some of you should recognize it. Chayu. Sound familiar? Eshe Chayu, Proverbs 31, 10 through 31, the virtuous woman. Okay, so Chayu is, is instead of wealth, in most translations, it's not that that's wrong because that is one of the meanings of chayil. But what I'm getting at is it's uh, it's valor uh, almost implies political power, uh, clout, you know. strength, strength, inner strength, inner strength. 
word. Yeah, it, because in some places where this word is used, it is actually talking about soldiers. It's talking about uh, men of war. So, uh, so this, I guess what I'm driving at is this applies to more than one area of life. It's not just about businessmen gaining money. It's about all, it's, it really, you could say, you could, you could say it, it, it equals to success. Sort of, I, I think for us, this wouldn't be a direct translation, but the English mindset. You know, we kind of think of success as having a certain degree of abundance in multiple areas of our lives, right? I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is I didn't want you focusing on money when you read that verse. It is, it is very deep. Well, here he's saying here it is. It's, it's not necessarily money, but it's it's. Uh, I think the best word. <coughs> yeah, prestige, success. Uh, uh, it goes beyond the boundaries of kesef, uh, the dollar, is what I'm trying to say. That's all I'm trying to say. So, uh, yeah, you you will say verse 17. My power and the might of my hand has got to be this chayim. Okay. Uh, but you shall remember, Yahweh your Elohim, for it is He that gives you power, laso, chayil, to do valiantly, is literally what he's, what he's saying there. Mm -hmm. To do valiantly. And so, remember Prince Valiant? Who was he? <coughs> he was the guy that could go out and save the world. And you know? That, you know? <coughs> it's kind of the concept here is, is I'm my own savior, I'm my own valiant. I can do. Oh, um, I would say the, um, the kind of my mind just jumped to another verse about you know somebody saying in their own heart that I'm God or something like that. Or not that there is no God, but put themselves in. I can't remember what it was. Isaiah something. Yeah, but, uh, Isaiah 14. You talking about what Hasidim said? I don't remember. But it's as a, a man saying of his own, just like what this is saying. Yeah. Well, uh, honestly, that is the ultimate deception of Hasatan. Is this goes back to the garden? What did he tell Chava? You will, you will not die. You will be as a god. Okay, you'll be as Elohim. Okay. Um, so I think, I think really what we've been talking about is the, the self success, the idea that. That we carry our own load, that we do this by ourselves, and that we have to be successful in the kingdom. Really, in my mind, these days, flies in the face of the vessel rod, the gospel. The gospel says, I am nothing. And I need everything from him. And that's what we're reading in these passages. Yeah. Israel is supposed to recognize. He brought us out of the shrine. He get fed us manna. He delivered us from Nahash. And, and Saraf, he, you know, or Nehashadaf, a burning serpent, uh, which, by the way, I don't know if we ever pinned it down, hopefully you went there in your mind, is an allusion to Hasatan himself. Yeah. Because who was in the wilderness when Yeshua was tested in Bami God? Hasatan. And that's one of the places in the Greek Hashem where he is actually called Hasatan in the Aramaic text. Okay, so, uh, but, so that's that's kind of the mindset of this earth is that we do it ourselves, and and the problem is is that's the mindset of a lot of Christian religion is that the, that the onus is on you and your success in the kingdom of Elohim is based on your action. If any, if you're putting any trust in your own ability, your own ability to set aside time, your own ability to set aside money for the kingdom, your own ability to, to teach, your own ability to to do anything, if it's all anchored in your own ability, it's not him. Yeah, it. Even if you're doing it in his name. Yeah. 
I'm willing to bet that those in here who serve in some capacity, like let's say the worshipers, the dancers, the teachers, we have all of those represented in this room. How many of you know that once it starts, once the actual ministry that you're doing starts, you have to let go and, and trust Him? Yeah. <laughs> you just gotta you know, prepare how you can, but if it don't go well, it, it ain't your fault. You know, if you're letting him do it, and, and, and of course you understand, there are times Lee can attest to this when we're up on the platform and the worshipers, and and everything that could possibly go wrong before we start goes wrong. Doesn't it? It would it would blow your mind <laughs> if we had a list. If I wrote that list of all the things that go wrong on Shabbat morning before we start, <laughs> we'd go out the door and on the road. The people down at I forty five would be reading our list. It's ridiculous. Some of the stupid things that happen that are beyond our control. And what is it? What it is? What is it about? I believe it's about us letting go. Of whatever our flesh is telling us and trusting that I was the one singing anyway. In one sense, he is. If we let go and he pours his book into us, he's the one that's going to do it anyway. Okay. Thoughts or comments, questions? There's that word in verse 18, there's a harta again, who remembers what zakar means. To remember by speaking, that's right. Recall. <laughs> 19. And it shall be, if you forget Yahweh your Elohim and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, I forewarn you this day that you shall surely perish. As the nations that Yahweh makes to perish before you, so shall you perish, because you would not hearken unto the voice of Yahweh your Elohim. Pretty staunch warning there. What is it the wilderness is all about? Getting Egypt out of the people. That's right. That's it. I'm glad you brought that up. What he's talking about, if I'm not mistaken, is you remember when they came out? They were out geographically. They were out of Meat's Rhyme. But what were they doing? Same thing. Don't go back. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and sadly enough, sometimes we do that in our own faith. And I think that's why we go through some of these same trials over and over and over again because we don't recognize. And that, that I think, is the key, is to recognize what we're doing is turning around and looking back at things. I did that every time I moved apartments. <laughs> because you get comfortable where you're at, you know where things are, you know where, where to go in the dark. It's, it's a mindset, and you don't want to leave what you're familiar you're and comfortable with. Sure. You don't want to go, out, go off into the unknown. Exactly. Yeah. Um, a couple of things came to my mind, especially when Paul said something about the wilderness. It, back in 15 where they're talking about I was just looking at that. He led you through the great and careful wilderness where venomous serpents and scorpions and drought and no water and I brought you water. What was it back when we were looking at the Nahash on the or the Nahoshit Nahash on the staves that they would see them and they'd run or they would see them and they they fled from them or something. Something happened where somebody was running from this thing or they looked at it well with blood. Um if I'm remembering it right, but it's the same thing here. And the Nahash is a snake, but it was in the desert, and y'all couldn't go in the, well, how many times they went around the desert in different spots where there was sin. So this, this great and terrible Godol Ben Ra wilderness was kind of holy. Mm -hmm. Just like the, the, the Nahoshit Nahashim on the stage were. Yeah. That we're supposed to make the people autocorrect. Oh, we can't do that. You can't do that. Just like Paul saying, it was supposed to make them turn. 
it goes back to, and I taught this years ago, and it's, it's a difficult concept to teach because some people just freak out when you say it, but uh, Abba, who, who put the serpent in the garden? Uh, and do you, do you think, what, what, let me ask you this, what did the tree of life What's the difference? Let me ask you this one. What's the difference between the tree of life and that other tree? What was the other tree? The tree of Do you not think that Adam wanted human beings to know the difference between the knowledge? He wanted Adam to ask. He wanted Adam to ask. He, 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 he wanted Adam to ask what is good and evil. What's the difference? He, want, he wants his people to know that. Hebrews chapter 5 basically comes out and says it. I think it's about verse 14 in Hebrews chapter 5. That in what he's doing is saying people who have moved on from the elementary principles of the faith and have gone into the meat of the word, they have practiced their faith such that they learn to distinguish between good and evil. It's just that Adam at that time only knew good. It's all he knew. Huh? He was innocent. He was absolutely innocent. Can an innocent, pure person know evil? No. I beg the difference. I beg the difference. Even with no outside influence. If naivety is wrapped up in the understanding of innocence, no. But if it's the innocence without naivety, yes. It I didn't possible. say naive. Right. Oh my gosh, he right. named every animal. <laughs> right, that's what I'm saying. If it's without naivety, yes, it's possible. Because he He's has a grown man. Because he has knowledge. But how is it? If you've never seen it, never experienced it. But how does he know it? Okay, so are you saying that Abba intends for us to experience evil in order for us to know it? We know already that we're taught in the Brick of the Shaw that the law was necessary so that every mouth would be shut. So I would have to answer maybe a qualified yes to the question. In some respects, I think there was something there for him to experience at a certain level so that he would have that knowledge. Sounds like it flies in the face of the disciples prayer. Kinda. <laughs> When, when the law created a God, he gave him the commandment. And then uh, Eve was created after the commandment had been given. Sure. Okay. When Eve was being tempted by Hasatan, Adam was right there. He was there. standing there. He was right there with He knew what the commandment said. He, should, he already taught her. So when he heard Satan lie and tell her that she would not die, or, or even implying that God was lying to them, Adam knew the truth, but he didn't do anything about it. So he, he was seeing evil. I, I agree, but that's not, that's not what I'm driving at. That's not what we're trying to arrive at here. The question, what, who remembers what the question was? He got it. That's not the question. No, 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 it was not about God's no, intent. That was not the question. Someone be okay, I need, I need one person talking. Shelly? Can someone be innocent and know evil? That's the question. That's the question. Can someone be innocent and know what evil is? Yes. Yes, you absolutely can. I have never heard a person, but I know it's wrong. And I know not to go do it. Yeshua I'm innocent. was absolutely innocent, and he was in every way a human being. The difference between
between him and us is he had the nature of Elohim in him. The nature that we have is a fallen nature. Adam had what Yeshua had. But because, and we don't know what motivated him, but because he, he instructed his wife, and it seems like he may have over-instructed her. Yes. Because she knew the commandment, but she also added to it. But probably Adam added to it. We can't say for sure, but somebody added to it. But he was standing right there, and he didn't correct her. He didn't he didn't protect her. He didn't protect her. But, but he, he could have stepped in and said, Chava, no. That's not what Elohim said. At that moment in time, that's what my portion got A man, you know, hearing of, of what his daughter is like and covering it. Overturning her, her time. Overturning her vows. Absolutely. That's right. The, 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 the whole point of the, of the priest of the home and the role of Adam was to step in. And this, I believe, is one of the biggest mistakes that men make in their lives is they don't, they don't instruct their wives and they don't step in when things are going wrong. They allow, for whatever reason, they allow their wife to make a bad decision. And they do so with knowledge. They know it's bad. They know it's wrong. But in order not to cause a ruckus in the house or something, they choose not to tell her, not to tell her, not to instruct her, not but to. My point was was that Adam should have had the discernment, and I believe he did. That's the same point that, that I made. That Hasatan was evil. That evil that's was the same. In the that's that's of right. That's the same. Life. He should have known. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now here, here I am. I woke up. In the face of an almighty being who, who, who I've seen with my eyes and who has who made all this and who told me he made everything and who gave me his Torah, gave me his instruction, and here is this other created being that I named Nahash. Crafty is uh, the creature in the garden, is what it said. That's right. This beguiling thing he should have known. And I believe he did know on some level. But that, we can't know that. That's just my speculation. You know what I'm saying? Okay. My point being is that Messiah was, and if we don't accept, and this is why one of the things about the Trinity that I don't accept, if we don't accept that Yeshua was in every way a human being while he was on this earth, then he wasted his time and we're wasting our time. If, if he was anything other than what we are, and not subject to fall, then it was a waste of time for him to go through what he went through. Right? It had to be, he had to have the ability to fall and then not fall. But he didn't have the fall nature. I said that. He, did, he had the divine nature in him, but I also said, and I believe this, that Adam also had that in him. Adam was 100% pure. Well, he was made in the likeness of God. He was made in the image of Elohim, that's right. And in his demut, yes. shape and character. Okay? So, you can be innocent and know what evil is. And the book of Romans somewhere, and it'll take me a while to fish it out of my head, but somewhere in the book of Romans it basically says, be innocent of evil. So, we're supposed to know what evil is, but you do not have to taste it in order to understand it. I believe you do not have to taste it in order to understand that it's evil. The problem is, is that we've inherited that same curiosity that Chava had. <laughs> well, at that point right there, you have to you have to go directly to him as soon as it, that's it's it. happening. You have to. That's it. And that's what Yaakov teaches. He said. It's either Yaakov or Yochanan. I can never, I always get their books mixed up. The, the 1, 2, 3, John, and James. Um, one of them says, uh, sin becomes sin when it is, when it goes into the, I, somebody finds it. It's birthed in the mind, and it becomes sin when it comes down into the heart, and then you act on it. Is Yaakov? I think it is. That was my first instinct, is that it's in the book of Yaakov and James somewhere. Sin is, begins in the mind. And what, what Mike is saying is, 
as soon as it gets into the mind, which it did in Yeshua, it got into his mind. You're the son of Elohim. Turn those stones into bread. Does the word say? And what does he say? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of Elohim. It's false. Man shall not test. Nasu or nasa. You shall not try to prove that he exists. You shall not try to uh, be a banner to him. You shall not try to be his miracle. I mean, all of that applies. It's, it's kind of an aside, but um, I also like that, you know, he says when Hassan is throwing church right the work, also love that he says it's also written. That's right. And he says scripture back because I think for us, you hear, you know, somebody take one scripture How do and build the whole thing around it. You know, without looking at all the scriptures on that. Every yeah. religion does it. Yeah. Every religion does it. And that, that's such a... Baptist faith, faith was built on John 3.16. Pentecostal faith was built on Acts 2.38. Uh, the uh, Church of Christ faith, faith was built on Mark 15.20. I mean, you could just go on and on and on. They build a whole denomination around the verse. So yes, you do have to. This is why we're studying this book because if someone throws something, he just equipped us for everything. That's right. There's an answer for everything. For everything. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So I took a women's class a couple of weeks back, and the first thing that popped in my head is um, Mike said, what "Sorry, said? my brain's like really not here. It is, it. but it's not." Mike said was, um, and he said, you just have to stop and you <coughs> stand up. The first thing I thought about was this was to ask, you don't aim for the stick. You don't aim for the person's head to defend. You aim for the wrist because your wrist follows the first thing that comes to you, not the end of the stick. And you get in there and you deflect with the wrist. And it just, that's the first defensive thing. Timing is, a, is important. And it's <coughs> It, it gets your reaction time and how long you last in this fight, so to speak, gets longer the longer you wait. Yep. So, so on a practical level, how do Mike? How do you put your hand up on a practical level? I mean, you know what I'm saying? <coughs> well, you did that up so long. You know, it, it's it has been a long time in coming. I can tell you that. <laughs>
for someone who has a, an issue with something that is bedazzling to the eyes, you know, Baruchata Yawa Elohim Melachalam Asher Yesh Lo Ba'aretz or Yesh Lo Ba'olam, who has such things in his world, mm. or who has created such things in his world, you give him the credit for it and understand that he made it, and it, you know, if it's a woman, you're not to objectify it. He created her for a particular reason. All of a sudden, you're taking the, the advantage away from Hasatan because you're engaging Allah in this whole process. And that, I believe, is how you stop the thought from sinking down into the heart. Mm. And, and really actually get rid of it. Yeah. Well, yeah, it says that you're supposed to take every thought captive. That's right. And it's been really interesting because I've noticed, you know, you get bombarded with certain things. And it's always the thing that's the hardest. And one thing that I... You know, I keep coming back to what you said, you know, we can trust in every word of God. And that it's not our own strength and our ability. And it goes back to this, that we're not supposed to be our own savior. And so even just sitting there, you know, blessing, but also going, okay, well, you got this. I don't, because I don't right. need it, but you yeah. do, and you need the glory. So yeah. to break that whole... Yeah, and, and you know, I, I think it was just the mercy of Elohim because when I was 21, 22 years old and struggling with life, struggling with being a young sailor in the world, just looking at you in the face, you know, and recognizing, okay, now I need to live this life that he called me to when I was 11 years old. You know, knowing that I wasn't, the, the only thing that, you know, there, there, were some, there were some key Baptist hymns that had the word in them. That I would sing to myself because, you know, I could probably still sing them because they're embedded in you when you see them week after week. For a young person, it's, it's a lot, especially one who's not married. You know, it's a, it's a big, it's a big world of temptation out there, and so the first thing that I would do is begin to sing. And, and it's, sometimes it took five minutes, sometimes it took two, sometimes maybe more than that. But every time I was delivered from it, every single time. So bless Yahweh. Is that? That's why, if you're wondering why we push the sedur so much, because. When you do that every day, you'll have it in you when you're walking down the road. Right. You know right. what I'm saying? Right. That's right. Okay. So let's finish up chapter 8. Those last two verses, we'll look at them again. Then, Haya, Im Shachor, Tishkach, Et Yahweh, Lohecha, Ve Halachta, Achare Elohim Acharim. Um, I think there's two doubles in here, and anytime there's a double, you gotta pay attention. Okay, so the first double is Shafoa Tishka. Forget and forget. You could really say utterly forget. Okay, and then the second double is down at the end. Avod tovedum. Destruction with destruction will, will be destroyed, or destruction will destroy you. Or perishing will make you perish. Okay, but it's almost like. <coughs> Look out, look out. <laughs> uh, you shall forget the Allah your Elohim and walk after Elohim Acharim. And that says other gods, literally it means later gods. And I think we've talked about this. I think we talked about this when we did Ten Bevarim, where. Uh, Literally, the words there is Elohim Acharim. So, you could say that it's someone who is taking the Elohim of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov and redefining them. A different Elohim. Even though it reads in the English, 
other gods. You know what I'm driving at? Are there people who do that? Absolutely. One of the, the, the biggest religions on the earth right now, probably, is Islam. And they do that. They think that they worship the Creator. They say they worship the Creator. They call Him Allah. But they attribute the attributes of Elohim to Him. And they say that they like His book. They use his book. It's quoted in the Quran, and they call Jews and Christians the people of the book. Okay. Ibrahim is their father. Uh, yeah, Ibrahim, they claim Ibrahim. 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 They claim him as their father, mm -hmm. and so that's taking Elohim and redefining him. Mm -hmm. Now you get what I'm driving at. <coughs> okay. I believe in one way Christianity did that, especially in the realm of Catholicism. It's taking Elohim and redefining him, changing him from one entity to three. Okay? Uh, <coughs> That's what they did with the golden calf, basically. Absolutely. That's exactly. It was supposed to be him. They called it Yahweh. Exactly. They stuck his name in it. I forewarn you this day. I confess before you. I, I testify to you today. And I get a witness. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> that destroying will destroy you. Equal to his voice. Right. 
Are you with me? It, it is my contention that no one hears the voice of Elohim down in their soul until they have submitted to his written word. I have, I'm probably boring some people who've been here for any length of time, but one time when I was living in Kirkville, we were, we had just gotten frustrated with Christianity I had and all the baloney that was going on in the congregation we were attending, and so we had backed out just before we moved up here, and we were praying about what to do, and a preacher comes to the front door. Of course, I'm like, hey, you know, I'm out on the back porch, we re re redecorated this house inside out, I was, you know, working on that, and uh, Melanie comes out the back door and says, there's a preacher at the front door, I want to talk to you. I was praying, you know. So I go to the front door, and this this guy has as wrong in his size as he could be, <laughs> puffed up, high and mighty. He says, "Lord told me to bring salvation to this house today." <laughs> And he would just, he would not relent. And I, I, I figured that he had probably been at my neighbor's house who was an old woman with, with Parkinson's, you know, barely standing at the door. And I, I was just imagining what he must have done to her. And, and, and the more I thought about it, the matter I got. But I, I was able to contain myself. And, and he said, and I, I reasoned with him. I can't remember the conversation. It's been 23 years ago. But I said, I said, no, the Lord didn't tell you that. Because if you were talking to the same Lord that I know, He told you that I was out on my back porch praying, talking to Him when you got here. Well, if you didn't come to the Lord through the Baptist church, then you might. He literally said it. And I said, I said, do you honestly think that? He said, yeah, the Lord told me before I got saved that I was going to die a Baptist preacher. I said, you might die a Baptist preacher, but God didn't tell you that. You're probably going to die a Baptist preacher, but that's a shame. I mean, I let him have it at this point. Because I said, you know, you can't, God doesn't come to an unsaved person, and, you know, and tell him how wonderful he's going to be. You know what I'm saying? He hadn't even, by his own testimony, he hadn't even heard the word of him. He, you know, it, it's, it, he doesn't, it, that's not the way he operates. And what I'm trying, the point that I'm trying to make here is that the word of God comes first before whatever comes out of some human's mouth. You know, or what you might think in your mind. If what, if what you think in your mind that you might think is the voice of Elohim, and sometimes it can be, but it may not be. Because if it doesn't match what come what came out of his word first, then it ain't him. I'm sorry. And there are people, there are people who have said that God told them they didn't have to keep the Sabbath. I'm like <laughs> I was at a church where a guy said that God was telling him to divorce his wife and marry some hot stewards. <laughs>
in Brett Post Shaw, they had knowledge of the Word. They were trying to figure out how to use it and understand out of it how they were to be saved. It was already up here in their head. The Word was in their head. They were trying to figure out if they knew it right, if they were missing something. The, the guy that was beside that got uh, immersed immediately was to stop me now. The guy that was rich, he was sell all and he turned away. They, these guys already knew in their mind what the Word was. Okay, on back on to, to on the <laughs> verse twenty. Um, we were talking about um, well, there's an interesting word in it. Yes, it's a kev. It's, it's always been kind of an attractive word. We've got a four portion named after it. I was like the word to reward, but it's also the word to heal. It's also the word to not cold. That's right. Will be a reward. You know. Um, so, but it's referenced here, and the first time I searched it, um, it's showing us in Genesis 22, 18, when and it's lightning back onto this verse, where it says in Genesis, Genesis 22, 18, and your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Mm -hmm. And then, back to Deuteronomy 8, 20, like the nations which the Lord destroys before your face, so shall you perish, not be obedient to the voice of the Lord of God. So it's just kind of interesting. Your reward and your obedience wrapped up in the same thing. Well, from what I pull out of the word again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out because this is sort of the, the root word of Yaakov. Okay. Um, and Yaakov means to supplant, usurp, to wrestle oh. into a different direction. Go ahead. It's, so, <laughs> go ahead. So, um, it says back in earlier Genesis where it talks about and uh, he will strike at your heel and you he will crush his head. Okay, so he will try to strike at your reward but you will crush his head with obedience. Mm -hmm. right. And think about it that way. And he's the last of the patriarchs. And his name got changed to Israel. Mm -hmm. So there's some stuff there. There's a lot in that word. Mm -hmm. Because you would not hearken unto Kol Yahweh Elohim, the voice of Yahweh your Elohim. So after all of that, yeah, I kind of want to reiterate. Uh, hopefully, we haven't already passed it up, but I think there's several places in the book of Deuteronomy where Kol Yahweh, the voice of Yahweh, is actually double, I mean, immediately equated to his commandments. So be on the lookout for that as you're reading. Because there are verses, and I believe several of them are in the book of Deuteronomy, where, where he says, this is my Torah, bam, the word voice is right next to it. So... So go ahead. Um, it, hold on, I need one more. Um, I think it's like right after. <coughs> yeah, it's the Genesis 22:18 is right after Adam takes Isaac up. It's already referencing Jacob, the reward. Right after he goes in the the angel tells him, "Don't do it." Right. But it took, you know, listening to his voice, obeying his voice first in order for the reward to come through. That's right. That's interesting. Very interesting. Okay. <clears throat> Thoughts or questions, comments? Go ahead and nine, then. We've got a few more minutes. Shema Yisrael, Ata over Hayom and Hayarden, Lavo, Vashen Goyim, Gdolim, Va Atumim, Mimecha, Arim Gdolot, Kvetovot, Vashema. Hear, O Yisrael, you are to pass over Yarden, Jordan, this day, to go in and to dispossess nations greater and mightier than yourself, cities great and fortified up to heaven. Am Gadol Ram, the 
great and mighty or exalted high up people. Uh, B'nai Anakim, the sons of Anakim, Asher Ataya Beheta, the Ata Shamita, Mi Yatzev, Nifne, Bene Anak. Sons of Anakim, who you know and of whom you have heard say, Who can stand before the sons of Anak? Is this the first time that we've encountered this people, this name? Who remembers? No, in the book of Deuteronomy. It, it, well, it is, but it's it's not the first time that we've encountered it in this study because what do you think? Back. We went back. Right. So, if I'm not mistaken, when we when we did read the chapter Deuteronomy chapter one and two, and we did a review of sort of the land and the territory, that Anak was in there. Who remembers where Anak was? The Anakim. Okay. Uh, east side. They were already across the river. Weren't they? They were up in the heart of the land of Israel. So, remember they conquered how many cities on the island of, down on the... 60. 60 cities down there. And then they crossed over. And then they started with Jericho and, and started conquering all of those. Uh, well, they, they were supposed to cross over. They went in and looked. And they came back and said, these people are too big for us. They're giants. They called them Nephilim. That's not who they were. And what happened with Anak? Who remembers it? I, I think we alluded to it. We did go look at Joshua to see what happened. That they were actually Anakim were in the land, but it says nothing about their height. They weren't terrifying. They were small people, and Joshua took care of them. Remember? Okay. So, <clears throat> what if Gadol Varam? If Yahweh says they are Gadol Varam, he's not going to lie. So, what does he mean? Disregard your English translation. What does he mean? We've already talked about this. Prideful. High and mighty. That's what and Yeah. <laughs> That's what it means. So they they think they're they think they're the cats meow. The they think they're the top of the wall. You know, put whatever redneck phrase on it. <laughs> That's what they think about themselves. Eric. Psalm says that word um, is arrogant. Here for arrogance, and then that goes violence for the mind of God. That's right. They're arrogant. Kind of like ISIS. Kind of like Yeah. Okay, verse 3, and then we'll probably wrap up. Vayada Eta Hayom, and you shall know this day, Ki Yahweh Elohecha, that Yahweh your Elohim, Hu Haover Lefanecha, Esh Ochlahu, He is the one who crosses in front of you. A consuming fire is He. Yashvidem, destroying them. Vehu Yachmiem, he will bring them down Lepanecha before you. Ve Horashtam. And he will drive them out. Ve Ha'avadatam. And destroy them. Maher. Soon. Quickly, if you will. Ka'asher diber Yahweh la. As Yahweh spoke to you. As Yahweh worded to you. Is Maher the same as Mahar? No. It's a different word. Maher means quick. Okay. Yeah. It's a hey instead of a. Okay. Oh, I'm not reading. Okay. Super okay. Wait a minute. Okay. Know therefore this day that Yahweh, your Elohim, He's the one who goes before you. This goes back to what we were talking about in the previous chapter. He's the one doing all of this. He's the one that gives you wealth. He's the one that gives you the ability, the ability to be valiant. How can you look at that? He says, if he says, when you have done all of this. Don't look at yourself and say, 
my strength and my mighty hand has gotten me this valor, this status, this wealth. How can you look at it in, in, the, in the light of the fact that it is Yah that goes through? This is something that, because many of us, many people in this country right now especially, are concerned about their own ability to keep a job, to get a job, to do, you know what I'm saying? To, to increase it, to put enough money aside for, for a stormy day, to, to, okay? So could we look at this verse then and say, I shouldn't worry about that stuff because he's walking ahead of me? Do we have the same promise as they where he's a consuming fire going before us? One of the ways that I try to lean on this concept is when I'm dealing with cantankerous people. And it's not the people that I'm dealing with. It's the spirits behind their behavior. Sometimes you can get a person who otherwise has a, has a decent demeanor and all of a sudden they just become a devil to you. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't do anything. All of a sudden, you know, they just change. You know? Only before the second cup of coffee. <laughs> so, so I guess what I'm getting at is how many of you have a, you know, have a situation where when you go into your place of employment, which you need to do, you're dealing with people that you don't want to be around, you know, and that, and that are that are, <laughs> that, are, that are making life difficult. Okay. Sometimes I give it back, so I'm just a little Yeah. But we, you know, I guess what I'm getting at is it, it, it ought to be that when, when we've done our prayer time in the morning is that when we're walking out the door we recognize, okay, you're, you're there, right? You're right there. I think it just for me changes my mindset that when I, when I do approach or am approached by someone like that in whatever context, Abba has it. He's already... And if I leave it alone, if I don't get back into the fray, that's when he will do it. If we get in the fray and go tit for tat in the conversation or in the in the situation and try to pick at it, you know, in the least little bit, we just leave it alone. I told I told a friend of mine who's in a situation like that, and I said, you have to get to the point where it means nothing to you, where this whole situation means absolutely nothing to you. And that, because you, you can be free in that moment. Even if they're, if they're still dealing with whatever they think the situation is, you don't have to. And what does it do? It drives them out of their freaking mind. <laughs> it does. And eventually they come to you. And they, they come to you with guilt. And they come to you with contrition because they recognize... I've been doing this to the wrong person, you know. And Abba can speak if they belong to him. He can speak to them. If they don't belong to him, he might just move them out of the way. I've had that happen for me. Abba has done that many times, where the person that was the problem just all of a sudden, if I left them alone, he just moved them out of the way.
whose heart beats no longer, who lives this way in the true place. King of my king, Father, our king, in the name of Messiah, that you will be your thanks for your blessings toward us today. And we pray that this baby be safe and the mother be safe and that those doctors do their job with accuracy and safety and give life into that situation. Not only you would be sure that you would stand there and be in their midst and bring that baby into this, into this life uh, with health and peace and thank you for this. I ask you also that you uh, cause your word to be uh, to become our, our food tonight. That you go down inside of us and change us and we grow by it. And uh, we ask you to be with our, our whole body, the congregation of the and the body worldwide. Uh, to be with us until we assemble again on Shabbat. And uh, we thank you for the Shem Shuash. Amen. 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 Amen.